If you started building moderately complex WebGL applications, you may have noticed something. Uniforms go from being incredibly easy to use to kind of annoying. They're super easy at first. You, you just look up their locations and then at draw time, you make some calculations and upload the new values. It's simple. But then you add a second WebGL program to solve some new problem or improve performance. And now instead of updating your uniforms once, you have to update everything twice, once for each program. And this will keep happening. Each time that you add a new program to your application, you may need to add another set of calls with the exact same uniform values. Of course, you're going to write your code in a way that hides all of this repetition, but those calls, they're still happening. And at a certain point, you've got to wonder how this is going to affect performance, which is why uniform buffer objects were introduced. Here, instead of sending values to each uniform one at a time, you're given a block of buffer memory on the GPU. WebGL reads directly from this memory for its uniform values, and whenever you want to update these uniform values, you just update the buffer. This makes your draw call logic simple and extremely fast. The catch? Well, initialization is not exactly trivial. It's not crazy, but it's not beginner friendly either. But I hope by the end of this video you'll see that they're not really so bad. There are really just three things that you're going to need to understand to get going. First, you're going to have to start using uniform blocks to define and group your uniforms and your shaders. This is easy. Next, you have to understand how to get your data into your shaders now that your uniforms are in these blocks. This means learning how to structure your data so that everything is where WebGL expects to find it. This can look pretty complicated, but usually, for most use cases, it's totally not. For example, if you're just using this for a camera view, for model view projection matrices, it's almost not even worth talking about. I'll go over the rules in this video anyway, but most of these rules may never affect you. And last, you're going to have to learn how to create the uniform buffer objects themselves in JavaScript. And, and yeah, not the simplest thing that you'll learn in WebGL, but also not rocket surgery. So, in your shaders, where before you had this, now you have this. Everything else is the same. This is called a uniform block. All that really matters here is the list of block members here, specifically their data types and their order. Nothing else is really super important, not even their names. If two shaders have uniform blocks that have the same data types in the same order, they're good for sharing. This is the block name. There's more to it, but for us, its only purpose here is to get a reference to this block from our JavaScript. You can use any name that you want, and there's no reason that you have to use the same block name across all your shaders. Optionally, you can also add an instance name, in which case you'll need to use this as a prefix any time that you want to use one of its members. Next, we have to talk about our data, or more specifically, our data layout. Because in order to send our uniform values to the GPU, we have to know exactly what values go where. See, when WebGL comes across a uniform block like this, it's going to immediately decide on its own what memory structure to use. We know that in this case there will be a float, and then after that somewhere there will be a vec3, and then after that somewhere there will be a mat2. So it will appear in that order, but if you were expecting the memory to look like this, you'd be wrong. It would probably look like this instead. All of that empty space there is padding. And this is due to something called alignment. This is something that also happens depending on optimization settings in languages like C and C++ and Rust as well. It's done purely for speed, so it's a good thing, but it's not very intuitive. So we're going to need to make sure that the data that we send to the GPU conforms to this layout. Now you have two options here. It's possible to query the GPU for the relevant offsets, and though I won't go into it here, this is something that you can easily do yourself. But the second and by far easiest solution is to use STD140. This is a layout rule set. If you add this layout qualifier to your uniform block declaration, like this, you'll automatically be using this rule set. And if you understand its rules, you can easily predict exactly where every one of your uniform values has to go. So you'll know where to put things, and WebGL will know where to find things.
Here are those rules. It's super short. I'll link to it in the video description. You can pause the video and try to make sense of them right now, but it'll make a lot more sense if I give you the quick overview first. So, for uniform blocks, memory is organized by the GPU into chunks big enough for four floating point numbers. Only four. And everything must fit cleanly into a single four float chunk or into multiple four float chunks. No exceptions. If something can't fit into an existing chunk, it gets shunted down into the next available chunk. Bools, ints, and floats, they are the smallest possible uniform data type in WebGL, and they each take up the space of exactly one float, and they can appear anywhere and after anything. How about combos, like a float and then an int and then a bool? No problem, they'll appear one after the other. You can keep adding these until a chunk is full, and then move down to the next chunk. A vec2? These take up the space of two floats, which makes total sense, but they're special, because they can only ever appear either in the first two spots of the chunk, or in the last two spots of the chunk. Can you have a, a float and then a vec2? Sure, but the vec2 will have to appear in the second half of the chunk, so there will have to be some padding between them. What about a vec3? That takes up three spots of a chunk, like you'd expect, but it can only ever appear at the very start of a chunk. Always. No exceptions. Y you could, if you wanted, put a float in after it, but not before it. If it can't be first, a vec3 will always move down to the next available chunk. Of course, there are a lot more data types to cover, but you know what? That's pretty much everything that you need to commit to memory for STD140. Floats take up one spot and can appear after anything. Vec2s take up two spots and can only take up the first half or the last half of a chunk, so sometimes you need to add padding. And Vec3s take up three spots and can only appear at the very start of a chunk. Everything else? Simple. Just assume they hog up the maximum amount of room as often as they need until everything fits and add padding, sometimes a lot of padding, according to the rules that you already learned. A Vec4? That takes up an entire chunk, obviously. But what about a mat 4? That's 16 floats. Too big for a single chunk, so obviously it just takes up the space of four chunks, right? Also, just pretty obvious. Mat 3s are more complicated and, frankly, pretty annoying. See, matrices are always treated like arrays, and arrays get their own special rules, so it may be worth remembering this, too. With arrays, each member gets its own chunk. Always. No matter what. So, a mat3 is treated like an array, an array of three vec3s. Each member gets its own chunk, so that's three chunks, and, because they're vec3s, they each will appear only at the start of each chunk. So it will look like this. Vec3, pad, vec3, pad, vec3, pad. It's super unlikely that you'd ever use a mat2, but if you ever did, they'd follow the same rule. A mat2 is treated like an array, but of vec2s. So, vec2 pad pad for one chunk, and then vec2 pad pad for the second. And of course, you can have arrays of ints and vec2s and vec3s and vec4s. You can have arrays of mat3s and mat4s. Same rules apply. And that's pretty much everything that you need to know about STD140. Not too crazy, a bit troublesome, especially for the mat3s, but not impossible. A word of advice? This isn't Tetris, so don't create a conceptual mess just in order to save a few bytes. If it makes your updates easier, sure, but memory is cheap, and alignment means speed, so focus on keeping your code clean, sensible, and easy to update, and WebGL will make sure that it's fast. Last, it's time to tie things together in our JavaScript, but for this to make even a little bit of sense, we have to take a big step back. So, our application has several WebGL programs, and each program will have some uniform blocks. What we want is for some of these blocks to share the same data. To do this, WebGL has to have some way to know which of these blocks are related. It can't determine this on its own, so we have to tell it that. And we do that by picking a number. It's best to start from zero. So, I'll just decide that these will be zero, and then these will be one, and these will be two. The exact order doesn't matter. This number value that we've assigned here is called the Uniform Buffer Binding Index, but in this video I'm going to call it the Binding Point Number, so it's less confusing. And again, this Binding Point Number is just a number, a number that we decide. So that's pretty easy. We've organized all of our buffer blocks into groups, 
Each group has members that have the same data types in the same order, and we've given a number to each. At the same time, we've got some buffers. These buffers will contain the data that our uniform blocks are going to need. Again, WebGL has to have some way to know which buffer goes with which set of uniform blocks, because it has no idea, so again, we use these same numbers. This one goes to 0, this to 1, and this to 2. So now, all of our uniform blocks are organized by a binding point number, and so are all the buffers. So we're all ready. All that's left to do is to let WebGL know what we've decided. To do that, we explicitly connect each uniform block in each program with its binding point number, and explicitly connect each buffer with its binding point number. Task number one is done with uniform block binding. It's a great name because we're connecting a uniform block with its binding point number. The syntax for this is, unsurprising, first the program, then a reference to the uniform block itself, and last the binding point number. How do you get that reference to the uniform block? Well, if this was for regular uniforms, we'd use get uniform location, but this is for uniform blocks, so instead we call get uniform block index, and its syntax is identical to get uniform location. The only difference is that it returns a number, which uniquely identifies the uniform block in that program. So our final code looks like this. Task number two, which connects the buffer with its binding point number, is done using bind buffer base. The syntax for this also is pretty unsurprising. First you specify the target, which is always uniform buffer, and then the binding point number, then the buffer, which has to exist first. Call this, and WebGL will now know which buffer data to use for each binding point number. There's something else to say about this. See how it's called bind buffer base? Normally, to populate a WebGL buffer, to fill it in with data, you'd use bind buffer and then either buffer data or buffer subdata. In fact, that's exactly what we're going to do in our draw call. But bind buffer base also allows us to do the same thing, so now is a great time to call buffer data, either to pre-populate your buffer with usable data, or allocate RAM on the GPU for that data. You don't have to do it now, but I'd recommend it. Oh, and I should also mention, in addition to bind buffer base, there's also bind buffer range, which I won't go into here, but you'd use this if you wanted to put the data for two or more uniform blocks into a single larger buffer. Once you understand bind buffer base, it's pretty self-explanatory, and it's yet another way to reduce the number of calls you make to the GPU in your draw call. So that's it, our initialization is finished, and our code looks like this. We decide our binding point numbers, we associate our buffer blocks with each of these binding point numbers using uniform block binding, and with that our shaders are taken care of, and then we create our buffers, bind them, and link them to our binding point numbers using bind buffer base, and call buffer data to either pre-populate the buffer with data or allocate space on the GPU for that data. And now that our buffers are taken care of, initialization is complete, and at this point you don't have to worry about binding point numbers or uniform block indices or any of that. You don't even need to unbind anything. You just need to keep a reference to your buffers because that's how you're going to update your uniform data. And if you pre-populated your buffer using a float32 array, you might want to keep that around too. Everything else it doesn't matter. You don't need it. So finally, let's move on to the draw call. Here, all we need to do is update our buffers. That's it, nothing else. But <laughs> this is where we have to pay close attention again to those STD140 layout rules and put our data exactly in the right places. So what do you actually have to do? You have a bunch of options, really. Here are two. First, let's assume that you only need to update a single uniform, like maybe you have a model view matrix uniform block and all you want to do is update the view. Here, you can send the new data straight to the buffer. Call bind buffer and call buffer subdata using uniform buffer, the offset in bytes to where the matrix data lives, and the new matrix data. If you're updating more than that, or, or say you need to update something that's full of padding, like a MAT3, you may want to do all the data management in JavaScript. Here's where it makes sense to retain your original float32 array if you use that to pre-populate your buffer. So make the updates that you need to your float32 array, 
call bind buffer and call buffer subdata. You can send over a single portion that covers only the bits that have changed, or you could send over the entire float32 array. These tend to be pretty small, so the penalty of sending all of the data, including stuff that hasn't changed, isn't going to be that bad. There are plenty of other ways to do this. Just do what makes the most amount of sense, but try to keep your calls to buffer subdata down to a minimum, since the entire point of doing all of this was to reduce all this CPU-GPU traffic. And that's it. If you're still here, good for you. I, I'm glad that I didn't scare you off. This stuff has a reputation for being overly complex, but I think that's a bit unfair. The complete STD140 rule set is a bit annoying, and things like MAT3s are a pest, but it's not too bad. I hope that you end up using this at, at least once. Take it for a spin and see how it fits into your application. And if you do, please leave a comment below so that others know what you thought of the whole experience. See you next time.